Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in person and virtually. Um, today, it's really great to have Dr. Kelly Mikowski here today. Kelly is a clinician scientist in comparative oncology. Uh, she's working uh, currently in collaboration with Jaime Modiano. She completed her undergraduate degree at Northeastern University in Boston in biology and her doctor of veterinary medicine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She followed that with a residency in internal medicine while she simultaneously completed a master's degree in veterinary clinical sciences at Iowa State uh, prior to joining the Modiano lab as a postdoc where she was a fellow supported by the um, T32 that I direct, the Molecular Genetic and Cellular Targets of Cancer program where she was a, um, an excellent uh, addition to that program and a strong alumni of that program and that's why I invited her today to tell us about her research. She's been developing her independent research as a clinician scientist where she sees pet dogs and cats 20% of her time and spends 80% of her time doing research and has just gotten a fantastic score on her KO1 um, in her new line of research which is focused on osteosarcoma and exosome signaling in cancer and metastasis. And she hopes to be able to translate that between what she learns in animals and pediatric uh, cancers. And so thank you for coming today. It's really exciting to have you and, and learn about what you do. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Lang. And I would just like to say that, uh, especially as a recent um, alumnus of the T32 training program, it's a real honor to be able to present my research, um, especially one of the T32 designated spots. So my seminar is entitled Molecular Signatures of Disease Behavior. I do have a couple of disclosures that are relevant to this work. I am listed as an um, inventor on the, the following um, intellectual property applications which have been filed by the Office of TechCom here at the University of Minnesota. And these relationships are reviewed and managed by the U in accordance with its conflict of interest policies. So I just want to start with some take home points to frame the rest of my talk. Um, we identified a canine osteosarcoma exosomal gene signature using a xenograft mouse model. We then validated this gene signature in the serum of dogs with osteosarcoma, where our results were predictive of prognosis following treatment, which suggests the ability of our gene signature to detect minimal residual disease. And my ongoing work includes applying this methodology to identify gene signatures that are associated with um, osteosarcoma risk and biological aging in dogs, as well as identifying genes associated with prognosis and pediatric osteosarcoma. So I do want to mention that while I was on the Molecular Genetic and Cellular Targets of Cancer T32 training program, my primary project was actually evaluating the immune response induced by oncolytic fire therapy with vesicular stomatitis virus in dogs with osteosarcoma. And we entitled that the VIGOR clinical trial. Um, despite that being my primary T32 project, I won't be discussing that project today. However, if anyone is interested, I presented that work about two weeks ago at the Veterinary Clinical Sciences Grand Rounds seminar series, and I'd be happy to share that recording with anyone. Um, so instead, I'll be talking today about a project that I picked up toward the end of my T32 program, which is evaluating exosomal gene signatures in canine osteosarcoma. And the reason that I chose to speak on that project today, um, even though it wasn't my primary project during my T32, was because this um, project really forms the foundation of the independent research program that I'm working to build. And so my ongoing and future research, which I'll discuss after the canine exosomal gene signature, includes using our gene signature in the early detection setting, um, as well as looking for genes associated with biological aging in dogs, and looking at molecular signatures associated with prognosis and pediatric osteosarcoma. So with that, a little bit of background. Um, osteosarcoma is the most common primary tumor of bone, and it's most common in young children, adolescents, and young adults. Um, osteosarcoma is treated with a combination of surgery and chemotherapy, with surgery typically consisting of limb spare surgery when feasible and amputation when not. Um, which is both preceded by and followed by chemotherapy. And as you can see in this graph, which shows five-year um, progression-free survival with osteosarcoma over the past several decades, 
Um, since chemotherapy was introduced um, in the 50s and 60s, there was a, an increase in um, prognosis, an improvement in prognosis. However, since that time, over the past several decades, there really has not been a significant change in prognosis. And even though this graph is a few years old and novel therapies are continually being investigated, these have shown modest success. And so really, um, there's still a clinical unmet need um, for new osteosarcoma diagnostics and therapies to guide um, treatment. The rarity of this disease in children, however, does limit clinical testing of novel therapies and, um, and diagnostics. So it's good that this is a relatively rare cancer with fewer than 1,000 cases diagnosed in the US each year. However, it does limit clinical testing. Um, so cases that present for clinical trials are typically heavily pretreated. Um, and also there's a, a paucity of samples that are available for um, research studies. So this is where potentially dogs with naturally occurring osteosarcoma can come into play. Despite being relatively uncommon in um, humans, osteosarcoma is a relatively common canine cancer, and the disease shares certain biological similarities with humans. So this is a figure showing the anatomic predilection sites for osteosarcoma in both the dog and human. And you can see that there are some differences. However, um, similarities include that osteosarcoma can occur in both the axial and appendicular skeletons, and there is a predilection for the long bones of the appendicular skeleton, with osteosarcoma occurring most commonly in the long bones of the lower limb in human adolescents and in the long bones of the forelimb in dogs. And this is likely due to weight distribution between the two species. Um, Osteosarcoma is treated similarly in the dog as in humans, um, with surgery and chemotherapy being the mainstays of treatment. In the dog, surgery typically consists of amputation, however, limb spare surgery has been reported, and surgery is typically followed by systemic chemotherapy. As in humans, um, death due to osteosarcoma is largely due to pulmonary metastasis. However, in dogs, this typically occurs in a compressed progression time of less than about a year. Um, median survivals are about one year. Um, and this is likely due to differences in lifespan between the two species. So about one year represents about 10% um, of the average lifespan in dogs. And this is a thoracic radiograph of a dog that was treated for osteosarcoma. Um, it underwent treatment, um, can, including uh, amputation of the affected limb, followed by systemic chemotherapy. And as you can see in this radiograph, um, about four months after therapy, um, the dog experienced progression of its disease with multifocal pulmonary nodules about four months later. And this progressed despite um, changing therapy protocols to um, progressive disease and ultimately euthanasia five months after diagnosis. So this compressed progression time actually does favor the use of dogs as a model for testing new things because you can evaluate response to therapies in a more limited um, time frame. So despite the similarities between the two species, there are some key differences. Um, one of these is the age at diagnosis. And so this is a graph that I made for a review paper a couple years back, showing the age at diagnosis in humans and dogs with osteosarcoma. Human age is shown in the bottom x-axis um, in years, ranging from 0 to 100. And canine age is shown on the top x-axis, ranging from 0 to 15 years. And both y axes show the number of cases over the total number. And as you can see, dogs with osteosarcoma have a smaller peak um, early on in life at around two years, and then a much larger peak in incidence between about eight to 10 years of age. So when they're older to mid middle aged to older. As opposed to children with ad, uh, osteosarcoma that are most commonly diagnosed um, relatively young, so the peak age of onset is between about 12 to 16 years, and there is a much smaller peak later on in life, around 80 years of age, but um, uh, adolescent osteosarcoma is by far more common. And so both species do exhibit somewhat of a bimodal age distribution, but as you can see, it's um, quite different between the two. Another difference is that dogs that are presenting for clinical evaluation are most likely treatment naive as opposed to humans that are often heavily pretreated. So it's important to acknowledge that even though the dog does represent a model for human osteosarcoma in some instances, um, it's important to recognize that there are differences and uh, only certain aspects of the disease have um, direct translation. 
So with that, I'd like to shift gears a little bit in my background to um, talk about the concept of liquid biopsies. I won't go into great detail since this audience is likely familiar with this concept, but liquid biopsies refer to the use of non-invasive blood-based detection of disease-related analytes. There are several different analytes that can be utilized for liquid biopsies, and these can include circulating nucleic acids, such as DNA and RNA, um, as well as proteins, or in the case of cancer, one can utilize circulating tumor cells. And then fin the final category is the use of extracellular vesicles, um, including exosomes. And I'll talk about those in a bit more detail because that's where my work lies. So exosomes are um, microscopic vesicles that are secreted by cells in the body. They're membrane bound and they contain important information about the cell of origin and um, exosomal contents can include things like DNA, RNA, proteins, lipids, metabolites, etc. Um, cells can use exosomes as kind of a way to excrete waste products. However, they can also actively load these compounds into the exosomes, so they can utilize them for communication with cells downstream. Um, and this can include communicating with cells downstream to set up a more um, hospitable metastatic niche, um, for example, in the lungs, or this can include communication with cells of the immune system to cause immune modulation and increase tolerance to cancer. So it's clear that exosomes contain information that is important um, about the, the cell of origin. And for that reason, um, they have been investigated as potential diagnostic tools. Uh, another benefit is that exosomes can be efficiently isolated from several different biological fluids, including serum, plasma, urine, etc. Um, however, there are some potential limitations to the use of exosomes diagnostically that have precluded their widespread use. And the main limitation is that exosomes are secreted by all cells in the body. And so it can be challenging to distinguish your exosomes from your cell of interest um, from the vastly larger background of exosomes that are secreted by all the normal cells in the body. Essentially, it can be difficult to separate the relevant signal from the background noise. And so our lab has come up with some uh, methods of overcoming these previous limitations including one method that I'll talk about today using a xenograft mouse model. So for this work, we established canine osteosarcoma xenograft mouse models um, by injecting established canine osteosarcoma cell lines into immune deficient mice so that the mice developed canine osteosarcoma tumors. We then obtained serum samples from these mice and enriched for exosomes from the serum. We then sequenced the exosomal contents and aligned the sequences to a combined genome of the dog and mouse. And I want to acknowledge Milka Scott and John Garby for the development of this pipeline. Um, but essentially by aligning to this combined genome, we know that anything that specifically aligns to the dog genome had to originate from the osteosarcoma cells Otherwise, mice should not have circulating dog transcripts. And anything that aligns specifically to the mouse genome that's overexpressed relative to our control mice that don't have tumors indicates the host response to a canine osteosarcoma tumor. And by doing this, we can essentially use the mouse to filter out our relevant signal from the background noise. In doing these methods, we identified genes of interest that we then wanted to validate in the species of interest, in this case, dogs. So we validated our gene signatures in the, in the serum of dogs with osteosarcoma in healthy control dogs and dogs with other diseases um, to ensure that the um, signatures we are developing were um, relevant to our species of interest. So now that I've gone over the methodology, I'll move on to some results. Um, before working with our mouse model, we wanted to do some uh, investigation in vitro of osteosarcoma exosomes. So we first wanted to document that osteosarcoma cells do produce exosomes. And we first worked with human tissue. And I want to acknowledge that this was a collaboration with, um, one, uh, uh, with Brad Bryan, who at the time was at Texas Tech. Um, so for the next couple of slides, this is work that we did in collaboration with him. Um, and we utilized uh, osteosarcoma tissue microarray containing 80 samples of osteosarcoma tissue of different stages. And we looked with immunohistochemistry to document um, staining of tetraspanins, which are exosome markers, 
Um, and specifically with this, uh, this um, step, we did CD9 and CD63. And as you can see on the left, these are representative tissue samples from each stage of the disease, stage one, two, and three, using um, those IHC markers to document tetraspan in production. And you can see that um, in increasing stages of the disease, osteosarcoma tissue cells do produce exosomes at a greater frequency. So the rate of exosome production is correlated to the aggressiveness of the tumor, especially when you move from stages one and two to stage three, where there's metastasis, you see a marked increase in IHC staining. Um, so these images shown in A are representative samples, and the, uh, the box plots shown in B are the summative data from all 80 tissue samples showing that, again, we do see an increase in exosome production with increasing um, stage of the disease. We then wanted to show that canine osteosarcoma cells also produce exosomes. And so we did this with immunofluorescence, looking at three different tetraspanins, um, again, three different exosome markers. So in this case, CD81, CD9, and CD63 using immunofluorescence. And we did cell culture experiments um, using two established canine osteosarcoma cell lines, OSCA32 and OSCA40. These cell lines were established um, in the Modiano lab and have been very well characterized. Um, all previous work in our lab has shown that OSCA32 tends to have a less aggressive phenotype and OSCA40 tends to have a more aggressive phenotype. And as you can see by this red staining, canine osteosarcoma cells do also produce exosomes in vitro. Um, well, we didn't perform any quantitative evaluation of this. We are more just concerned with making sure that our human reagents worked in canine cells as well. For the next step in vitro, we wanted to evaluate if canine osteosarcoma exosomes could be taken up by human cells. And so we transfected a canine osteosarcoma cell line, OSCA40, with a um, CD81 GFP vector. And the image shown in A documents that we were able to achieve stable transfection of this um, CD81 GFP vector. And then we enriched the cell culture supernatant from this experiment. Um, and ex we enriched exosomes from the supernatant and applied those exosomes to cell culture uh, of two different human cell lines, human pulmonary fibroblasts and human pulmonary endothelial cells. And as you can see in both the figures, uh, hopefully you can see um, with the green staining and uh, in the bar graphs, we do see that within about 24 hours, the human um, cell lines are able to take up the canine osteosarcoma exosomes. Oops, I don't know. Sorry about that. I don't know why that's just appearing. Um, so uh, we then went on to characterize extracellular vesicles that we enriched from our canine um, samples. So we, when working with exosomes, it's important to document that what you are enriching for is indeed consistent with exosomes compared to what's in the literature. And this is typically done through a combination of methods. Um, the first method that we did was electron microscopy to document the size and shape of the enriched microvesicles. And as you can see, we're enriching for microvesicles that are round in shape and range between about 50 to about 150 nanometers. And this is consistent with what's reported with exosomes in the literature. We then performed immunoblotting to document enrichment of tetraspanins in our exosome lysates from different um, canine osteosarcoma cell lines uh, and depletion of beta actin. Uh, relative to cell lysates. And again, this is what's uh, reported for exosomes in the literature. And then finally, we perform nanoparticle size analysis using nanocyte to show that we are enriching for extracellular vesicles that are um, around 120 to 150 nanometers in diameter. And the nanocyte also gives us a concentration of enriched vesicles as well. And so these experiments were all done using cell culture supernatant samples, and we wanted to make sure that the samples that we are enriching from um, serum were also consistent with exosomes. So we performed nano, nanoparticle size analysis of serum enriched exosomes as well. So this is a representative healthy control serum sample in A and a representative osteosarcoma serum sample from a dog in um, B. Again, showing that we're getting microvesicles that are around 120 to 150 nanometers in diameter. 
So upon documenting that canine osteosarcoma cells do produce exosomes and that our methodology does work in dog samples as well, we then went on to do our osteosarcoma xenograft experiments. And so we implanted, um, we injected canine osteosarcoma cell lines, uh, OS1 and OS2, which are derivatives of OSCA32 and OSCA40 parental cell lines, respectively, into a mouse model. Um, so that the mice developed canine tumors. As mentioned, OS2, which is an OSCA40 parent, uh, derivative, is considered the more aggressive phenotype, um, as you can see by increased tumor size um, and more development of metastasis in the OSCA2 treated mice. And then we sequenced um, serum exosomal contents from these mice. Uh, as mentioned, we then aligned the sequences to a combined dog-mouse genome to use the mouse model to filter out our relevant gene transcripts. So these are two heat maps. Um, in both cases, these heat maps um, display genes that are mean-centered after log transformation. And so anything that is overexpressed is shown in variations of this red color. Anything that is underexpressed or shown in variations of this purple color. And in both heat maps, the control mice, which were not given osteosarcoma tumors, are in the left columns. And then the treated mice that did receive canine osteosarcoma, osteosarcoma tumors are in the right-hand columns. The heat map shown in A shows uh, genes that specifically aligned to the canine genome so that we know that all of these genes uh, directly originated from the canine osteosarcoma cells. Um, so we ultimately ended up with a panel of 25 genes that we had um, for evaluation that were osteosarcoma derived. The heat map on the right shown in B shows all of the genes that were um, expressed that specifically aligned to the mouse genome. Um, and so these are genes that are either over or under expressed um, in our treated mice relative to our control mice and therefore represent the host's response to the tumor. And while both of these represent imp important aspects of the disease, we focused mainly for this project on the genes that directly originated from the canine tumors um, because we wanted to look for signals that told us osteosarcoma presence or absence. So we started with this list of 25 canine genes that were differentially expressed in our treated mice. And we narrowed this down to a panel of 10 genes that were most differentially expressed. From that panel of 10, we further narrowed it down to the top five most differentially expressed genes that could be reproducibly identified in canine serum with QRT-PCR. So this left, left us with a five gene panel um, that we then went on to do in species validation with. Um, and so an interesting thing about this five gene panel is just looking at this, these are not genes that I would expect to be osteosarcoma specific markers. These don't really have anything to do with osteogenesis or um, bone formation or anything. Um, they're more genes that are associated with things like cell proliferation um, and cell cycle. And so it's a little interesting that these are the genes that we, we found using our methods, but this is what we found and this is what we um, went on to further validate in species. And so we had a total of 58 canine cases um, that we utilized. We had 13 healthy control dogs. We had 10 dogs with other diseases that were non-neoplastic. We had 28 cases with canine, a confirmed diagnosis of canine osteosarcoma. And from the vast majority of these osteosarcoma cases, we had both pretreatment and post-treatment samples. And then we had two dogs with other cancers of bone that were not osteosarcoma. These are the clinical characteristics of our enrolled cases. This is a busy table um, because it has all four treatment or all four enrollment categories. Um, the important take homes from this table are that our osteosarcoma cases were pretty consistent with what's reported in the literature for canine osteosarcoma. So these were primarily large and giant breed dogs that were older or middle aged. Um, I do want to point out two things. Um, so there was a difference in age between our osteosarcoma cases and our healthy controls, where the healthy controls were younger. Um, so I think our median age was uh, 7.4 in the osteosarcoma cases, as opposed to 4.8 in our healthy controls. 
Um, so that is one thing to note. Another thing to note is that our post-treatment osteosarcoma serum samples were obtained at um, highly variable times post-treatment. So all dogs were treated with standard of care. So this consisted of surgery. However, because of the variable time points where we got our post-treatment samples, um, dogs received variable amounts of chemotherapy. So you can see the range of our post-treatment samples um, goes from two days after surgery to 980 some days after surgery. So this is a huge range, um, but we were working with banked samples. So we, we work with what we have. We then went on to do QRT-PCR using our five gene panel relative to our housekeeping gene, um, which it was GAP-DH in this case. And these PCR plots show the expression of our five genes um, individually in our samples separated by groups. And um, the big take homes from this are that to the naked eye, there's certainly no pattern that we can see. It's not like one gene is um, highly expressed in just the osteosarcoma cases, but not the healthy dogs or, or whatever. Um, the big take home from this is that single biomarkers are not particularly useful, um, especially when you're dealing with a very heterogeneous cancer like osteosarcoma. And so this led us to want to investigate the use of machine learning to see if we could identify patterns um, with machine learning that would not be detectable otherwise. Um, so we then went on to do machine learning with our PCR results, and we utilized the healthy samples, the samples from dogs with other non-neoplastic diseases, and the um, pretreatment osteosarcoma samples where they had gross disease, and dogs with um, other bone tumors as our machine learning training set. So we wanted to train the machine learning algorithms to detect a signature that was consistent with osteosarcoma. Our machine learning test set was then the post-treatment samples from dogs with osteosarcoma. We evaluated many different machine learning algorithms, and I want to um, give some credit to Ali Kamanavong, who is our machine learning person who did um, this work. And uh, from these different machine learning algorithms, we then further evaluated the top three most sensitive algorithms, so the ones that were most able to detect a signature associated with osteosarcoma. These are the ones that are outlined in the blue boxes. And another busy table, but the take home from this is that we then evaluated our post-treatment samples from the dogs with osteosarcoma using machine learning. And as we were using the most sensitive um, we algorithms, we picked up um, our samples that were uh, still detectable osteosarcoma was present. Um, and so this leaves us with a smaller number of samples where our machine learning algorithms did not detect osteosarcoma. And this is because we were using the most sensitive algorithms. If we used, for example, the best performing, then we would sacrifice some of the sensitivity and, um, and benefit of the specificity, but we wanted to um, really use the most sensitive algorithms here to detect osteosarcoma. Um, so again, these are all post-treatment samples from dogs with osteosarcoma, and we used our machine learning algorithms to see if we could detect osteosarcoma in those serum samples. And we separated these out in a Kaplan-Meier um, curve. So this is showing progression-free survival. And as you can see, if our machine learning algorithms could still detect osteosarcoma post-treatment, there was a significantly um, worse uh, prognosis um, as shown in these teal lines here than if our machine learning algorithm could not detect osteosarcoma post-treatment. And we believe that this is due to the ability of our gene signature to detect minimal residual disease after treatment. So in conclusion for this part, we identified an osteosarcoma exosomal gene signature using a xenograft mouse model. Our exosomal gene signature was then validated in the serum of dogs with osteosarcoma, healthy control dogs, and dogs with non-osteosarcoma diseases. And the results in dogs with osteosarcoma were predictive of molecular remission post-treatment. And this suggests the ability of our gene signature to detect minimal residual disease. And this work was published last year in the journal Laboratory Investigation, which is the flagship journal of the US and Canadian Academy of Pathology. And from that, I'd like to move on to the current applications. So we are utilizing this methodology to investigate gene signatures and a couple of um, current and ongoing, um, as well as future projects, which I'll talk about a little bit here. So the first one is the canine osteosarcoma early detection test, which is um, the, we call the COED study. The second one is looking at molecular signatures 
associated with biological aging in dogs. And then the third one is looking at molecular signatures of biological behavior um, in pediatric osteosarcoma. And this is a project that I recently submitted a um, NIH K01 proposal for, um, and that's currently pending. So I'll first talk about the co-ed project, canine osteosarcoma early detection. Um, and our aim in this project is to evaluate and also expand upon our canine osteosarcoma gene signature in the early detection setting. I say in the early detection setting, but it's probably more accurately described as detecting um, risk of developing osteosarcoma or predicting risk. So we aim to use machine learning to predict the likelihood of osteosarcoma development in otherwise healthy dogs that are considered to be at an increased risk of developing osteosarcoma. The first part of the co-ed study is um, where we aim to expand upon our machine learning training set. So enrolling dogs with confirmed diagnoses of osteosarcoma or other cancers, as well as healthy control dogs. To um, enroll in this study, dogs must have either a confirmed diagnosis of osteosarcoma or a different type of cancer, and they must still have evidence of gross disease. So this has to be either before amputation with the case of uh, osteosarcoma or before tumor removal with other cancers. Or to be included in the healthy control group, dogs must be between the ages of two and four years old um, and free of other diseases. And um, two to four years old represents an age where dogs are both skeletally mature, but at a very low risk of developing osteosarcoma and other cancers. We aim to enroll 100 dogs total, and we've um, just started uh, collecting samples for this part. And again, these will be utilized as um, expanding upon our machine learning training set. For the second part of COED, um, this is our machine learning test set. We're obtaining samples um, from dogs that are considered to be at an increased risk of osteosarcoma development. So we have six target breeds, um, as well as an open category for other large and giant breed dogs and mixed breed dogs. Um, our six target breeds are the Irish Wolfhound, Rottweilers, um, Golden Retrievers, Irish Setters, Leon Burgers, and Great Danes. And these are all dogs that are confirmed to be at an increased risk of developing osteosarcoma. For example, the Irish Wolfhound is probably the biggest risk where up to 25% of Irish Wolfhounds will um, be diagnosed with osteosarcoma in their lives. Um, and again, we do have an open category for other large and giant breed dogs, um, purebred dogs, as well as mixed breed dogs. Um, to be eligible, dogs must have a confirmed pedigree to be included in the six target breeds, um, be greater than four and a half years of age, and be in good health. And we're enrolling dogs from all over the country. They send us serum and plasma samples. We aim to get 350 dogs total, um, so that is 50 dogs per group, and we're on our way. I think we probably have somewhere around 75 or so samples so far. Um, and at this stage, we are banking samples till we get a, a larger number where we will start processing and um, sequencing and performing PCR. We will then use machine learning to predict a risk category for each individual sample. So um, they can be assigned to categories such as unaffected, osteosarcoma high risk or high risk of other cancers. And then we will follow these dogs out for the lifetime of the dog um, using clinical questionnaires every six months uh, and obtaining veterinary records when necessary to determine which dogs do develop osteosarcoma so that we can use either our current gene signature or an expanded version of our gene signature to determine genes that are associated with an increased risk of osteosarcoma development. The next um, kind of current or ongoing study or future study that I want to talk about is molecular signatures of biological aging in the dog. And there are a couple of rationales for this. Um, as I mentioned when I was going over the clinical demographics for the canine exosomal gene signature study, the dogs with osteosarcoma in that study were significantly older than the healthy control group. And I noticed that that was a pattern that was present in lots of different early detection studies in dogs, um, including like pan cancer detection tests and other um, cancer tests. And so it made me question whether are we truly detecting genes that are associated with osteosarcoma or are we just detecting genes that are associated with an older age and dogs that are older are indeed at an increased risk of osteosarcoma. And that was kind of rationale part one. Rationale part two is this concept of biological aging, um, where one's chronological age is how old you are, 
in years, but one's biological age is how old you seem or feel or your risk of developing age-related diseases. And it's certainly been observed that dogs and humans age at different paces than each other, um, even within individual dog breeds. So you might see one dog that is 10 years old and acts like a puppy, another 10-year-old dog acts like a 10-year-old dog. Um, so that's this concept here that um, led to the development of this study. So we want to expand upon our co-ed study to get more samples to investigate this. And it will also help us to interpret our co-ed results as well. Um, and this is a graph that I made for a review paper showing um, increased risk of osteosarcoma and decreased life expectancy with increasing size of the dog. And so this was based on um, some older data from this paper um, from 1998 that looked at odds ratio of developing osteosarcoma in various dog breeds. And as you can see, large breed dogs have a higher risk of osteosarcoma in shorter lifespans. Smaller dog breeds have um, a much smaller risk of osteosarcoma in increased lifespans. And this is true of all cancers, but it's particularly evident with osteosarcoma. So our aim with the aging study is to use similar methods to our co-ed study to determine genes that are associated with biological aging. We plan to utilize samples from the co-ed study to also look at genes associated with aging, but we plan to increase our cohorts so that we are spanning the entire lifespan of the dog and expanding upon the breeds that we're um, enrolling. We will then follow this up with more extensive questionnaires um, and apply machine learning to assign risk categories of developing age-related diseases in these dogs. And then my final project um, of the independent research program that I'm building is the one that I submitted a KO1 proposal on, um, and that's looking at molecular signatures of biological behavior in pediatric osteosarcoma. Since the majority of my previous background was about canine osteosarcoma, I'm just going to touch on a few things with pediatric osteosarcoma here. Um, of course, pediatric osteosarcoma is a devastating disease. Up to a third of patients develop metastasis and ultimately succumb to their disease despite receiving aggressive therapies um, like surgery and chemo. It's been noted that survivors have an increased risk of treatment related um, morbidities, and this can include secondary treatment related malignancies as well. Not every patient requires as aggressive of therapy. However, there are currently no ways to determine who does um, because accurate predictors of response are, are lacking. And so currently all pediatric osteosarcoma patients are treated the same, um, regardless of whether they truly need um, as aggressive of therapy. And prognosis is especially, especially dismal when there's either uh, metastasis at the time of diagnosis or if metastasis develops despite therapy. So clearly there is a need for um, tests that can inform prognosis and guide therapy in pediatric osteosarcoma patients. So for my KO1, um, I propose doing uh, the first specific aim where we will um, sequence serum exosomes from pediatric osteosarcoma patients that have known clinical outcomes. So we are going to be receiving a relatively large cohort of about 300 pretreatment serum samples from pediatric osteosarcoma patients. And these are patients with known clinical outcomes. We will sequence serum exosomal contents, and they will, we will look at factors that are associated with the development of metastasis. For the second specific aim, um, we propose doing similar methods to what we did in our canine um, exosomal gene signature paper, where we will sequence serum exosomes from pediatric osteosarcoma xenograft mouse models with differing metastatic propensities. So we propose uh, uh, obtaining um, uh, developing mouse models, xenograph mouse models, using um, human osteosarcoma cell lines that have differing metastatic propensities, um, establishing tumors, and then obtaining serum samples from these mice, monitoring these mice with non-invasive imaging, and uh, as well as necropsy at the end, and then determining genes that are associated with the development of metastasis. Um, this is the panel of cell lines that I intend to use. Um, it's worth noting that there are not that many established pediatric osteosarcoma cell lines, um, but I've identified these six that are relatively well characterized and have differing metastatic propensities ranging from low to intermediate to high. Um, and there is some representation among these six cell lines with regards to male um, and female patient, as well as morphologic subtypes. So we're trying our best to capture the heterogeneity of the disease as best as possible using a xenograft model. 
So the goals of the KO1 are going to be to develop and refine a robust gene signature using a combination of genes identified with each specific aim. And we think that by doing so, we will identify um, genes from each aim that can be utilized together to form an even more robust signature that will be able to predict prognosis in pediatric osteosarcoma. Such a test could be utilized clinically um, to ultimately improve management of this devastating disease. And um, this is a, a figure that we've developed uh, that we call the patient journal, journey that um, identifies places in the patient's treatment and monitoring where such a test could be utilized to inform um, therapy. Um, and it could be that this is one test or multiple tests, but anywhere that you see a blue box is an area that uh, a gene signature test could be utilized to help guide therapy. And an example would be at the time of diagnosis where a patient that was predicted to have a less aggressive disease could therefore receive less aggressive therapy and reduce the chances of secondary morbidities without impacting prognosis. Whereas one that was predicted at the time of diagnosis to have a more aggressive disease could justifiably be treated more aggressively or be guided to experimental clinical trials to improve their outlook um, of longer term survival. Another place that a test could be utilized clinically is with monitoring for relapse after remission. Um, and so, Going back to my take home points, um, we identified a canine osteosarcoma exosomal gene signature using a xenograft mouse model. We validated that gene signature and canine serum and our results in osteosarcoma cases were predictive of prognosis post treatment suggesting detection of minimal residual disease. And our ongoing work includes application of our methodology to identify gene signatures associated with osteosarcoma in the early detection setting, as well as genes associated with biological aging in dogs, and then finally genes associated with prognosis in pediatric osteosarcoma. I have lots of acknowledgments. Um, this was a very collaborative project, but I would like to first thank um, Dr. Lang, um, both for inviting me to speak at this talk today and also for all the guidance during my T32 time, as well as Jaime Modiano for um, his mentorship over the course of my postdoc and as I transitioned to an independent researcher. I'd like to thank all of these collaborators that I have listed here um, who helped to work on this project, as well as the current and past members of the Modiano Lab and ones that specifically worked on this project or the current um, iterations of, of this work are shown with asterisks. I'd like to thank the technicians at the CIC, which is in the vet school for um, help enrolling dogs. And of course the dogs and their families for allowing them to participate in their, our studies. And I'd like to thank the um, K01 committee that I have assembled for their help and guidance in um, assembling my K01 proposal and also as I start to do the actual work. And with that, um, some pictures of my own pets, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. All right, I've got microphones for anyone who would like to ask a question. That was really great. It's really nice to see on how you can develop the informative data from cell lines and then apply it. So just, you know, I'm a breast cancer medical oncologist and the biggest challenge for liquid biopsy is can you use any of that information to change treatment or the course of the disease? And what I mean by that is I don't, we, in breast cancer, at least, we've had all sorts of assays that predict recurrence, and nobody uses them because it doesn't prolong anybody's survival. To be able to predict an early recurrence is int academically interesting, but there's, and I hate to be fatalist about this, but there's not a lot that's actionable. I think in our world, that's changing. You know, people are looking for somatic BRCA mutation or estrogen receptor mutation or HER2 amplification, a lot of other areas where you could actually prescribe something that might change your course, but still testable. So at any rate, how do you think about that in osteosarcoma? Is it good enough to predict early recurrence, or do you have to have the ability to pick out a molecular phenotype that you, your genotype that you could do something about? That's a great question. And at this point, I, I think we just don't know. It is a very heterogeneous cancer. And so we just don't know what we're going to find. But the goal would be to move towards a more personalized medicine where we can really use 
that person's phenotype to guide therapy instead of just currently treating all pediatric patients with blanket treatment. Um, and as far as actionable, that's definitely something that we thought about for our early detection tests as well, um, because nobody wants to hear that their dog is a ticking time bomb for developing cancer. So we need to have something if we predict a high risk of this dog developing cancer that we can do about that. And clearly you wouldn't want to treat dogs with chemotherapy before they developed cancer. But um, I think a couple of ways that a, an early detection type test could be utilized in dogs is either recommending more frequent or more extensive screening tests to look for cancer if the dog was designated to be at a higher risk or potentially using something that has a very high safety profile like um, there's been some work in my lab uh, looking at ebat which is a i'm sure you know which is a, a therapy that has very low toxicity and theoretically could be used before cancer is developed to try and decrease chances of cancer actually being established um, and we did talk about having that as a, a potential treatment arm, depending on in our co-ed study, if there is a high risk of the dog developing osteosarcoma, do we treat with EBAT? Um, but we, at this point, we, want, we need to evaluate our test results first, because if we treat dogs with EBAT, we won't know, did it work or were those dogs incorrectly assigned with machine learning? So long answer, hopefully I answered your question, but thank you. All right, any more questions? Let me just check our virtual group. Um, I don't have any questions there, so let's, uh, oh, Carol, Carol's got a question. So you, that was really, really nice. Thank you. Um, you didn't talk too much about, have you learned like any sort of big revelations between comparing human to dog? as far as some of your genes that popped out in your exosomes or is are there similarities that could provide leads to to how to deal with that in humans so we haven't gotten started on the human work yet so i don't have any genes but we did think about do we just evaluate our dog genes that we identified in humans and i think we need to let the human models tell us to look at so i, I we you know, we certainly will, will have the information we can evaluate those same genes but it would be dangerous i think to go into it thinking that you could directly apply everything um so we're we're kind of starting from scratch with the human work to see what genes identify themselves to us yeah thank you all right if there are no more questions let's thank dr mikelsky one more time thank you thanks everyone <laughs> <laughs>